singing please you, you may be seated as we were singing I'm just beginning to realize that song remind me that we're working on a gonna be doing a series of messages on the armor and what appropriate would it be to sing that when we get there amen uh, faith is the victory faith is what gonna give us the conquering power to overcome the devil and his host even though they're encamped around you you know one thing, God has given us the shield of faith, but we got to put it on. So we're going to explore that, and we're going to work it out. Because if, if there's ever, ever a time when we, as Christians, even though we've been, some of us have been along the way for a long time, we need the covering of the Spirit of God, and we need to put on the right clothing so that we are able to do exceedingly above what we can imagine. Our scripture this morning is John chapter 4, the gospel according to John chapter 4, reading from the 31st verse to the 37th verse. Remember now, we, we're finishing up this week on a need for proclamation in the 21st century that we are in. <clears throat> I remember some time ago, I'd say maybe 20 years ago, 30 years ago, we were wondering what's going to happen to the world if we ever got to 2000. Well, guess what? We have done it 23 years and we keep on marching. Amen? So let's read our scripture this morning. John's account of Christ's command to us. He says in verse 31, Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. You remember this was after the encounter with the woman at the well. Amen? They had gone to look food, and Jesus sat by the well because he was tired, because he was human. He was not only God, but he was human. He was a God-man. And so they come back now with food and say, Rabbi, eat. And, but Jesus said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples were saying to one another, no one brought him anything to eat, did he? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields that they are white for harvest. Already he who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for the eternal, so that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this case the saying is true, one sows, one and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. The word of the Lord. <laughs> we need to recognize in becoming a Christian, God has other things for us. Not just to go around talking about how happy you are, but to go around telling people how happy I am because of Christ. Amen? My happiness doesn't come because of the things I have, because I don't have much. And whatever I have, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're fleeting. One minute they shine like gold, the next minute we dump them because they've lost their glow. And they lost that energy to give us something to hold on to for life. Let's pray, shall we? So, Father God, as we consider the world, as we look around on your world, we would be overwhelmed by its need for truth were it not for your grace that keep us going. So this morning we pray that you'll help us to not just see the needs of our world, but that we will also feel them. So may the compassion that flooded the heart of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ 
the Bible tells us that as he looked on the multitude, he was filled with compassion. And so we ask you then to fill us with compassion. Prompt us to share your message with the needy because they're all around us. Give us the courage to start in our household because what we practice at home, we'll be made perfect as we go bearing our sheaves. Remind us too, Lord God, that we who go forth bearing our sheaves, we may go in fear and trembling, but we will come back, no doubt, rejoicing. So bless our time and your word to our ear and to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, one of the things that has always marked Christianity is a sense of urgency. We tell people that Christ is coming back again. We know he is coming back again. But here's the thing. We don't know when. It could be the next hour. People say, oh no, so and so has to be fulfilled and this has... Everything that should be fulfilled have been fulfilled. It is only by the mercies of God that this world continues. Because folks, when you look around as children of God, sometimes we have to say, Lord, come. In spite of the fact that we love to live, we say, Lord, come. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Because your world is disintegrating every minute of every day. Every isms that you can think of suddenly arise. There's a fellow that I used to watch all the time, and he was very smart. Uh, I think it was, oh, I forgot the name of the show, but he came out there. To, he, came, he claimed he came out that he's a pan, was it now? Pansexual. I didn't know you can pansexual these days. But that's what he says. And I'm thinking, and you think that's going to give you some kudos? <coughs> he thinks that's going to make him a bigger star. And I'm thinking to myself, what's our world coming to? Are we in our generation watch, sitting and watching it fall apart and doing nothing? We are Christians. We have a message. What's the song said? To sing to the nation. We have a message to tell the people that Jesus Christ is their only hope. But Christianity need to recognize that we can't sit back and fold our hands and say, oh, may the Lord help. No. God has given you the power to go. He says, all power has been given unto me. Go ye therefore. Who is he talking to? He's not talking to the world. He's talking to those who claim that I'm Christ. I belong to Christ. That's why you call Christians. I belong to the family of God. And God has given me a message. So I need to spread the message. However I can. And there's a sense of, there ought to be a sense of urgency. Because people are dropping dead around you. Have you noticed that? And people say, Oh man, I was I meant to I meant to go visit them. I meant to go and they're gone. Don't let it happen. You see, this characteristic may be felt in any increased method today. We we are worried on every side. There's a strong feeling that the cause of Christ must step it up or lose its influence on society. And I think the reason why society is getting so bad is because we're silent. We're silent. We're compromising. We let them batter us into a corner where we said, well, why, what little, just little old me can do. Well, you are amazed what little old me can do when little old me is energized by the spirit and we're bold enough to speak God's word boldly. You see, Christianity cannot afford to drift along without any aim or purpose. We've got to point our arrows. We can't just shoot off madly all over the place. We got to be, we got to have a purpose. We got to have an aim. So, for the sake of both the salvation of the lost and the survival of Christianity and the Christian faith. 
the church today must become aware of the need for the proclamation of the gospel in the 24th century. You see, the 24th century of coming like a gangbuster. And some of the words that we're hearing, some of us don't even, even when we go, sometimes you ask Google, Google don't even know. Amen. When the church gets this deep down into her collective spirit and into her deep collective uh, conscience, I think it will start to cause a, a, a sense of urgency in our effort to proclaim the gospel that has been delivered to us by Jesus Christ. This is not a man-made gospel. This is, this is not some guy sitting in a cave contemplating his navel and got this inspiration. This has come from the very word of the God, Son, Jesus Christ. He brought it to us. He made God visible to us. And he said, now that you know who I am, go and tell people. Because they don't know. They don't know. They go to school. They don't teach them in school anymore. You remember when you went to school? Boy, scripture was one of your favorite subjects, wasn't it? Now, you can't even pray in school. Never mind bringing the Bible in school. So, we need to recognize there's an urgency. And to do so, first, we need to have a motivating purpose in life. We can't just say we're a Christian and just humping along, just jogging along. Waiting for the upward call of Christ in, of God in Christ. It's not going to work that way. We are called to do a work. The Bible says to each one is given a, a work. Every one of us as Christians has a job. We have a job to tell why we are who we are. And why we believe. We need to share it. Jesus in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 36 says. The Bible tells us about him. That when Jesus saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion for them. For them. Remember that word, for them. Because they were weary. They were scattered. They were like sheep without a shepherd. Having no leadership. Having no idea where they were going. We have young people dying in our cities because they don't have a clue where they're going. And they think of getting high is it. And getting high is killing them. They're dropping dead in our street because they don't know. They're searching and they're seeking. And instead of telling, what do we do? We criticize. Most of what causes people to become restless and miserable is caused by sheer lack of purpose. They don't know where they're going. They don't have a clue. Many have the joy, they kind of have the joy riders attitude towards, towards life. They're not concerned with whether they're going backward or front, forward. They're just floating along. They have as much reason to be in one place as the other. So, where are you going? Don't know. Where are you coming from? Don't really know. Don't remember. And so they not only burn up their energies without going anywhere, but they also miss the joy of the ride. You know, the most beautiful thing about Christianity is the, is the ride, isn't it? Is, is the living it. Is, is the experience in it. Is, is, is when you come to worship and the spirit take over and you begin to enjoy the Lord. Amen. Just by yourself. You don't even need nobody. You know, you just shout and you holler if you feel like it. Because you know the Spirit of God is in you and he's working and you, you can feel the joy of the Lord. People are looking for that. And they can't find it. You know, it's a shame that there are people in churches for years and they don't know the Lord. They're church goers. Because nobody's ever sat down with them and tell them the truth about the gospel of Christ. Isn't that unfortunate? Going to church all your life. I remember talking to somebody. They were in their 80s. Saying to them, you know, uh, um, they wanted to become a member of a church. And I said, well, there's only one criteria for being a member of the church. you got to be born again. And they looked at one another. And they looked at me. And they shook their shoulder. I said, what happened? So what do you mean by born again? 
Been in church for eight years. No one ever said to them, you need to be born again. Well, it was just like uh, Nicodemus, wasn't it? He was a righteous man. He was a leader in the synagogue. And Jesus said, Nicodemus, <laughs> what you got, my friend, is not enough. You need to be born again. Isn't that amazing? You're in church and you don't know the Lord. Because nobody spent the time to tell you. God has called us to tell. Right? And there is no substitute. You cannot substitute salvation. A motivating purpose in life is not found in the substitute that the world offers. You remember our scripture from last week where Isaiah asked the question, God asked the question, why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for that which does not satisfy? Doing good, some people says, is what's going to get me to heaven. Humanitarianism or goodwill is an option that the world offers. Do good to people. Accept them for what they are. Don't ever criti be critical. Just carry on. Like we're all on the same old happy road going the same place. No, we are not. You see, humanitarianism suggests we lose ourselves in serving others. But Paul warns us to be careful about making goodwill our God. Because, you know, we can make it a God. And he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 3, he says, listen, listen to what he said. And if I give my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned but have not love, what does it profit you, church? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Imagine that, giving everything you own. Giving it away to people, just... Paul said, if you don't have love, because God has called us to love. Love the Lord your God what? with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. And the second commandment, Jesus said, is what, like the first, isn't it? Love your neighbor as yourself. Beloved, your neighbor without Christ is on their way to a Christless eternity. And God said, love them. Love them into the kingdom. And don't be afraid of them to tell them you need Jesus. Don't be afraid. Then some suggest that higher learning can be it. You know, or get what you can, can what you get, and then sit on the can, and you'll be all right. But even that is inadequate. We see this attitude reflected in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, 16 to 17. Remember who wrote Ecclesiastes? The wisest man who ever lived. Before him, there was nobody as wise as him. And God promised him, after you, nobody will be as wise as you. So you figured he had a hand on everything, right? Here's what he wrote. He said, I said to myself, behold, I have magnified and increased wisdom more than all who were in Jerusalem before me. And my mind has observed a wealth of wisdom and knowledge. And then he said, but I realize that this also is striving after the wind. In other words, because when you come to the end of the book, he said, you know what the whole thing is? Trust God and put your trust in him and believe in God. He said, I'm the wisest man. If there's anything in the world to be known, I know it. God has revealed it to me. But all of that, without God, is nothing. Solomon says wisdom and experience will not solve every problem in this life. Won't solve the eternity problem, will it? Those who go through life living on explanations will always come up short. Why? If we got to come explain everything to you, why? Two reasons. First off, this side of heaven, in this world, you cannot always figure out why certain things happen to certain people. You just can't. And God is not obligated to explain everything to us. Do you realize God doesn't have to explain anything to us? 
He's God. But lovingly, he does. And even if he did explain everything to us, and we have all knowledge and all wisdom, we still wouldn't understand. Secondly, God has ordained that his people live by promises, not by explanation. He calls us to live by faith, not by works. Jesus says in John chapter 20, verse 29, Blessed are they that have not seen me, yet they believe. It is not by sight. It's by faith. It's not by explanation. God doesn't have to explain everything to us if we believe. If we believe when things happen to us, we're not going to throw our hands up in here and say, why me? The question should be, why not you? You're a human being. Besides, whatever happened to you, you know what he's trying to do? He's trying to kill you. Because you're going to die anyway. I don't know about you. <clears throat> I want to be hit the 100 mark. But if I can't function, it's a waste of time, isn't it? <laughs> I mean... It's all right, but God says we don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. God doesn't have to explain everything to us because we trust him, because we know that he's working everything for our good to those who love the Lord. Remember that, love the Lord. Remember that clause. If you love the Lord, he's not going to allow anything to happen to you. Unless he has a purpose. Amen. And even the bad things. He said, hey, I'm working it together. For your good. You just don't see it yet. But one of these days, you're going to come before me. And you're going to fall on your knees and say, Lord, now I understand. And he said, when you're a person of faith, you trust me that whatever happened, whether it's the good or the bad, I'm in it. I've allowed it. And because I've allowed it, I give you the power. I give you the energy. I give you the courage to continue. Amen. Don't let people throw you off your stride and frustrate you. Oh, I'm going to quit because this person is doing this and this person. Maybe you're there for a reason, to wear down that person. Can you imagine when you come in smiling at them every day and saying, how are you doing? Can you imagine sometimes it's the best way to cause an avoidance, isn't it? Because when they see you, they're going to hide. Because they know you're going to say, Hey, how are you? Have a good day. That's a word. That will encourage them to begin to think. You see, a motivating purpose in life is not found in religious pretense or veneer. God told the Israelites, whose religion was all a show, Jesus looked at them and says, you're like white a tomb. You look nice and dressed up outside, but inside is putrefied, rotten, stinking bones. No wonder why they killed him, amen? No wonder why they hated his guts. Because he told the truth. You see, he could look through the veneer and saw what they really were. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 15 <clears throat> The Lord says to them, these same ones, dressed up in the finery, philatery is bigger than what God had told them to do, tasseled on their, their gowns, walking across the street with hum humility, you know, sour face, that's not humility. But there they were, arms folded, head down, hat over their eyes, you know, yet wicked. And here's what God says, when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Can you imagine that? I will not listen to you because your hand is covered in blood. God said, I know your heart. I know your heart. You see, Israel's religion was based on a series of hard-hearted things to do. And some of us, we're no different. We think because we go to church, we got it made. 
And yet we go to church and cut up one another in church. Never mind the outside. God said, I'm sick of that. When you pray, I won't even listen. Right? Dress up on the outside, but rotten on the inside. And God says, that's religious veneer. I will not accept it. Religion in our day is very popular. But a religion, a veneer, is, poor, is a poor alternative through which people can see it and say, I want to be like that. Because they'll figure you out. You're not kidding anybody. I remember when we were buying our house years ago. We went into this house. You know, I went in and saw it. And the, the, the cupboards, you know, the kitchen cupboards, they were beautiful. Wood engraved, you know. And, and I'm looking at that. Because I'm, I'm, I'm not a carpenter. I don't know what's behind it. It looked beautiful. Oh, we were proud of it. That was the centerpiece of the kitchen, you know? Well, guess what? After a couple of months we were in there, one of them fell off. <laughs> and when I looked at the cupboard, it was a rotten old cupboard that that son of a gun had covered up with fancy veneer, you know? And here I am thinking, what a pretty kitchen. <laughs> And I have a wife who will shake her head and she said, that's got to go. Those things, when we took them up, they were like lead. They have been done a few times. And God says, some of you are like that. You've been covered over a few times. And I don't want none of that. When you stand before me to go out in the nation and show what God has done to a life, I want you to be genuine. And, and some of us, we have some bumps in our still. And some burr. I know that because I got them. But that's because God is still working on me, see? Amen. He ain't done yet. And, and, and I think with me, I think it takes a little bit longer. Amen. I don't know about you. <clears throat> so let me suggest to you today that a motivating purpose in life is found only in an encounter with Jesus Christ. A motivating purpose in life is found only through the saving encounter with the man on Calvary's Hill, Jesus the Christ. You know, the Apostle Paul was talking to King Agrippa, giving his testimony as to why he was a Christian. And Paul said, it all started when I have an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Acts chapter 26, 16, he said, I have a, he said, Jesus said to me, when I encountered him on the way to Damascus to persecute Christians, he said, Jesus says this to me. He said, I have appeared unto you to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only of the things which you have seen, but also of the things in which I will appear to you and I will show you as you go along. And Jesus is saying to you and I today, too, when you're a Christian, you don't know it all. You never know it all. But when you're faithful to witness, sometimes he said to them, don't even consider what you're going to say. Just when I present you with the opportunity, recognize that I'm the one who provides the opportunity. Recognize that I'm the one who's given you the strength. And I will remind you. I will put the words in your mouth to witness. All you have to do is to be willing to be used by God. But you know, brothers and sisters, to be willing to use by God, you've got to know the word of God. You've got to be reading the Bible. God don't work with nothing. God doesn't work in the vacuum. He works in that which, what was it Paul says, you know, study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that need not, what? Be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You've got to know the truth. So when you stand up, you speak truth. And it doesn't have to be a big old thing. You just got to tell him God loves you. You got to tell him that it doesn't matter where you've been. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from sin and keeps on cleansing. And you got to tell him, if you do not come to Christ, you're dead. You're literally a walking dead person. Because you need the spirit of God to quicken you and make you alive and by putting your faith in Christ. Now, you remember now we're talking about Saul of Tarsus, right? Saul of Tarsus already had a purpose and a goal in life. Remember what his purpose and goal was? To kill Christians. 
and to become high priest. But he says, when I met Christ, all my fancy stuff behind here, my doctorate didn't count for the excellency that I found in Christ. And I'm telling you this morning, your money ain't doing it. Some of you got a lot of money and you're miserable. And some of you got a lot of money and you're stingy. Some of you have a lot of money and you're hanging out to it because it's become your God. Some of you got a lot of money and you flutter it because you, and some of us, we don't have none because we what? <laughs> we give it away. It's a wonderful thing though. The more you give it away, the more you seem to have. You never have a lot, but you always have a little something. Amen? I always have a little jingle in the pocket, you know? Even though it's small change, I got something. Amen? And I will share it with you because what I'm trying to tell you that it's the love of God why I'm giving you this. I mean, I love a lot, but hey, I got all that I need. And because I have all I need, I can share it with you. So a motivational. You see, you got to have a motivational purpose. you got to have a directive purpose until Christ comes. But you can't have that until you encounter Christ. Because he's the one who cement that within your spirit. A motivational purpose imparts happiness and power. Have you ever noticed stingy people are never happy? You ever notice that? They're always hiding things from you. So they always feel guilty when you come. I remember one guy, you know, we used to pass his, his house. We were kids back home. Back this back home, you know. And he always used to cook late so that nobody can come to get anything. <laughs> and he usually don't cook at his house. He'd go into the bush where he has his field to cook. And you know how young boys are, are shifty, you know. We figured uh, Vince is going to cook at 4 o'clock this evening. We're just going to have to drop by. And we'll drop by and we shout him because we know what he's going to do. We'll call him. And all of a sudden, he'll fly outside, get the pot off the fire, hide it under his bed. And we'll sit there all evening talking to him. And hungry is killing him. And he won't go get his pot. And we used to laugh as young people. Imagine that. Well, we can't be Christians. We can't be God followers and be stingy. We've got to learn to, 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 to share. Someone says this, I quote, In an acre of sunshine, there is enough heat to melt rocks into liquids if only the rays are focused. Hear that? If the rays are focused in a mile of uh, sunshine, a saving encounter with Christ provides divine lens that draws our scattered rays into one purpose. We need to be of the same mind, going in the same direction, with the same purpose, with the same desire that God is going to use us together. Yes. Now, after you get a motivating purpose in your life, I think the next thing we need is a clear statement of the gospel. You see, we're telling people to get saved, and we're not telling them how. And we're not telling them why. You need to let them know that they're lost. Jack, Dr. John R. Rice used to say, you know, there's a lot of religious people around. You know, and before you can get them saved, you've got to get them lost. You've got to get them to recognize that you're a sinner before a holy God. And all your good works is not going to get you there. Right? You've got to tell them they needed Christ. So... In 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 8, and this is uh, translation is by the Living Bible. I thought it makes it real down to earth. Listen to what it says. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 8. And if the, ar if the army bugler doesn't play the right notes, how will the soldiers know that they are being called to battle? We got to tell people why they need to get saved. You know, we got to tell them it's not by your good works and your good deeds. It's not because you're a nice guy, but because you're lost. You've missed the mark that God set for us. But God is willing to change all that. That's why he sent Jesus. 
A clear statement of the gospel make the way of salvation plain to people. People need to know that God has set a pattern of behavior for us to follow. We need to know that we are all sinners before a holy and righteous God. You got to recognize God's who God is. He's holy, he's righteous. And he requires people to live holy lives. You don't hear anything about holiness anymore. It's just do your thing. God requires us to have to live holy. And you need to tell people that we failed. Every one of us. Because there is none righteous. Not even one, says the Bible. Because we, are, we have all fallen short of God's standard. So that is why Jesus came to pay the penalty and to bring us back to God. He becomes our barrister. He becomes our advocate. He's become the one who can sit in the middle, hold God's hand. Why? Why can he hold God's hand? Because he's holy. You can't hold God's hand. I can't hold God's hand. Because we are unholy. So Jesus, the righteous one, sits in between us. He can hold God's hand, hold our hand, and bring us together and make peace with God. You need peace with God before you can exp experience the peace of God. And that's why Jesus came. He's the only one through whom we can be forgiven of our sins and receive new life with the hope of living with our God together. No amount of good works is adequate. You're saved not by your works which you've done. You're saved through the belief in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And when you get saved, you begin to do proper good works. There is the need for morality that marks a Christian as distinct and different from the world. We are to be Peculiar people, not peculiar ha-ha, but to be peculiar, which means that we have a special relationship with Almighty God. And it does not mean that we're odd, but rather that we're different, that a Christian has a special relationship to Christ that causes us to behave differently, to behave different from the world. Our lives should be different, not because we have a superiority complex, but because we follow a superior code of ethics. We don't live for the world. We live for Christ. Christians' morality relates to the gospel of Jesus Christ. In John chapter, 1 John 3, verse 18. The Apostle John says to us, 1 John 3, 18, he says, little children, let's not love with words or with the tongue, but in deed and truth. What does John mean? In deed and in truth. He's saying, Christians, we're called to love people, to love God first of all, and to love people unconditionally. But it's not only by the words that we say, but we have some deeds to back it up. A lot of our young people are lost because they're watching us at us the way we live. We say one thing when we're in church, and when we get home, it's a totally different thing. And as important as words are, it's going to take more than words to bring unsaved people to Christ. People say, don't tell me you're a Christian. Show me. It's going to be by our deeds because our deeds will back up what we say we are. So it's not going to be just what we say. People are looking for examples 
what kind of example we're setting. People need to see Christian living what they say they are. Not telling me one thing and doing another. In the 21st century, Christians need to be consistent in their proclamation of the gospel because whether you know it or not, you're proclaiming something. First, we must believe the truth of the gospel with a stubborn, obstinate zeal. Don't ever compromise. Don't ever say, well, you know, maybe yeah, we can allow that. No. What does the Bible say? Never once in the Bible watered down truth. If you read the book of um, Jeremiah, you know, there were a lot of prophets prophesying in Jeremiah's day. They were saying, peace, 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 don't worry about it. And the Lord said to Jeremiah, tell them there is no peace, said the Lord. But they kept on prophesying this peace. And guess what? The people believed them. Because they would rather believe the corrupt priest than God's man, Jeremiah. They rather commit themselves to the corrupt priests who were worshiping idols than the God of heaven who created the universe. And God says, as long as you are in that kind of mindset, you ain't going to have no peace. Not my peace. So we must be passionate about God's word. We must believe the right things with great enthusiasm in spite of the conflicting views of the society in which we live. And boy, they're knocking us down one by one, aren't they? They're throwing things at us, but listen. Them darts can hit you when you're clothed in the righteousness of Christ and you're in your right mind. You see, we must rediscover the spring of motivation that prompted Christians in the past to stand up and declare Christ and die for it. If we can... All the misguided ideologies will have no match for truth. They can't stand up to truth. So Christians, the time has come for us to stop apologizing for our gospel and start proclaiming it. Stop making excuses. God don't need you to make excuse for him. Don't tell him, well, we know it's wrong, but God bless you. No, don't say that. Remember what Paul says in Romans 1. He says, you know, we, 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 we see them doing the evil, and we says, oh, go ahead, God bless you. He said, don't even say goodbye to them. Don't even say have a nice day to them. Because in so doing, you become a party to their lies. You see, the fanatical or the fanatism of evil and wrong ideas must be met by the enthusiasm of the gospel. The fallacies of today must be met by the truth of the gospel. You've got to stand on the gospel. And you're not going to be popular, but God didn't call you to be popular in this world. Because one thing is for sure, if you're popular out here and the world loves you and accepts you, something is wrong with your story. Jesus said to his apostles, they're going to hate you. And you know why they're going to hate you? Because they hate me. So I'd rather be in the little throng with Jesus, don't you? Than with the multitude who are sort of skipping through the tulip and going on their way to hell. The world needs to hear God's truth in the 21st century. And remember what we said some time ago. You play... God has called you to play a very important role in somebody's life. Somebody's welfare, future welfare, depends on you. You have a responsibility. So by the grace of God and the power of God, for the sake of God, play your part as a real child of God. Amen. And so now may God's grace and mercy and peace that comes through the death of Christ on the cross and the sending of the Holy Spirit to live within you and by the love of our Father God be with you this week. Energize you. Empower you with his blessing. With his power. With his strength. With his grace. And with his mercy.
Will you go in God? Amen. Father, we thank you again for your word. What a powerful word it is. What a powerful name it expresses. Give us the courage then to stand strong in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I thought we'll finish on a high note, 613. The very title, I hope will give you the energy and the strength and the courage this week. To be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. 613, let's stand and sing. <clears throat> Singing. Like a river glorious is God's perfect peace over victorious in its bright increase. Perfect yet it floweth fuller every day. Oh, perfect yet it groweth deeper unrest comes when we have been obedient to his word so if someone is out there and God is speaking to your heart this morning you need to say to him I understand what the preacher said I'm a sinner I need a savior and so now I come to you God to ask for forgiveness and mercy 
and to invite Jesus Christ to become that savior of my life. And as easy as that, the Bible says that the Father God will send forth his spirit in you powerfully to confirm and to affirm that you are a child of God. Not by your works, which you've done, but by his grace and his mercy. And so this morning, Father God, even we who have been walking this way for a long time need a refreshing and a renewing. So we ask you one more time to fill us again with your spirit and give us the energy that we need this week to live for Christ triumphantly. We know that the moment we say that, we are, becomes the bullseye for the enemy. But Lord God, you've said that when we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ, the fiery darts of the enemy cannot come near us because you are our shield. So shield us this week from the fiery darts of the enemy because we know that he's lined us up. But I pray that you'll bring everything that he has against us to nothing through Jesus Christ our Lord. Give us the power now to live victoriously for another week and to be a witness by what we say and what we do. Give us the energy, give us the power, and help us, Lord God, to keep you constantly in our vision, in our deportment, and in everything that we do or say, may Jesus Christ be seen in us for the greater glory of Christ our Lord. Now, Father God, I pray that you bless your people this morning and will bow before you. Enable them to be victorious. And we bless them in your name. And in the name of your Son, through the power of the Holy Spirit, amen.